If you're tuning into us for the first time, we like to do a little recap before we dive into the episode discussion, only because sometimes the episodes can be a couple hours long, and in terms of like Critical Role, it can be four or five hours long. So we like to do a little bit of a recap for you, and what we actually do is we cut that out as a separate video and throw it up on YouTube. So if you're watching just the recap, there actually is a link to our full episode discussion down below, so you can check that out as well. Uh, but having said that, this was Worlds Beyond Number, um, The Wizard, The Witch, and The Wild One episode 20 i think it's it's later than you think is the name of the episode maybe maybe just later than you think i think that's right and essentially let me put my little notes here the episode opens with the party at a cafe they're at a cafe meeting with pomeroy the spirit warden for lack of a better phrase the spidery spindly uh, figure in his human glamour form at a cafe and who has agreed to essentially answer whatever questions they have about himself the nature of the gallery and um, his relationship with grandmother Rin. now part of the reason they're here is because um, Ame knows his real name and essentially because of there being like power in a name it has created sort of like this blackmail effect of like hey tell us anything or we'll let people know what your real name is so there's a number of conversations that happen here uh, first of all Pomeroy reveals that he and grandmother Rin had a pretty strained relationship in that she basically blackmailed him to provide an in into the citadel, not just like with terms of information, but more specifically that grandmother Rin was occasionally allowed to um, come by the gallery and take certain paintings, uh, take certain paintings, basically. Yeah. Uh, and he offers, uh, they ask for a list of those things and Pomeroy says that it can be provided. Uh, Pomeroy also mentions that these paintings, whenever they are taken, that grandmother Rin would always time it with like big name thieves and crimes around town uh, to coincide with it so that people would be none the wiser. The other conversation that happens is uh, this conversation around Ursuline's sister, uh, the Badger, also known as Kalaya, who had been in the gallery some odd 20 years previously. Pomeroy reveals that Kalaya, something like 50 years before that, was actually pretending to be a wizard at the Citadel until some 30 years later she was found out to be a spirit and was effectively imprisoned in the gallery um, before being uh, released in an incident that saw many other spirits also being released. The party puts two and two together and realizes that this is actually what Ursuline found in the notes, in Suvi's notes, about her father, Soft, and that presumably Soft was one of the conjurers watching over the gallery and for some reason released a number of spirits, Kalaya being one of them, and that Kalaya has not been heard from or seen since. Uh, also, since this point, Pomeroy now watches over uh, the gallery uh, himself and basically says that um, he is endlessly devoted to the Citadel uh, and will always be in, um, in service of it. Um, also mentioned, um, well, the party actually say they say goodbye to Pomeroy. Uh, Pomeroy leaves, really not enjoying the sunlight. Um, but also mentioned is if we're going to find out more information on what Kalia was doing, and more specifically, maybe what she was even studying while she was here, it might raise some eyebrows for people who wouldn't want them to know certain things, or at least would um, might be suspicious. Uh, they table that. They decide to go to the court of Kabani, uh, which is the court of divination, to find out more about the wizard Sly, who uh, Grandmother Ren had told Ame was a true friend. Um, and effectively, they take a uh, a, a, a portal door uh, or a teleportation spell um, through one of the services in the city to arrive at this uh, court where they do in fact meet the wizard Sly, who is living in kind of like this ramshackle, kind of small, very um, Back to the Future dock. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, just stuff everywhere, stuff in its boxes still. And um, the wizard Sly, we find out being in the court of divination pretty much knows the future can tell the future. Uh, there's a joke about where he's like, Hey, let's go get a, you know, a, a donor kebab. And 
Uh, so he's like, well, should I lock the door? And he's like, no, no one's going to try to break in until a year and a half from now. <laughs> and there's a lot of like really, really cool comments like that. There's one moment where Subi's like, well, then I'm going to prove him wrong and I'm going to steal a ruby because there's like random rubies and like just stuff everywhere. Uh, and then later in the conversation, she feels bad and she gives it back to him. And he basically says, like, I guess you never stole it, huh? Just there in I mean, Brennan was just brilliant in that little stinger of a line. Yeah. But Anyway, getting to the point, um, they have this full-on conversation about um, the nature of the wizard sly and like what exactly he does here. And he specializes, I can't remember the name of the office, but it's basically like averting ca ca uh, cat catastrophes. Yeah. And we find out that um, it, his catastrophes he's working to avoid are not always in the best interest of the Citadel. Right. Though it's implied that sometimes he does present certain things as in the Citadel's best interest. For example, Suvi sees a report where um, it's basically the Mage Sly doing like a budget request uh, to avoid this event that's going to end the Saraz family line like 200 years from now. And uh, all the gold and rubies that are required, it's like 80, I think it was like 800 pounds of gold, but it all adds <clears throat> up to 85,000 Imperial Marks. Um, so despite that, he's effectively trying to do good, um, on the Citadel's bankroll, uh, and he does reveal some insights to the party, um, to Ursulon, he says that you're on the right track, uh, which really encourages Ursulon. But he also tells Ursulon, you're going to need a shield, otherwise Suvi and Ame will be dead within the next year. Uh, which they're kind of like, wait, what? Um, <laughs> there's also, that, but that's even like a tiny detail compared to what he tells Ame, which is, which Ame's like, hey, like there's supposed to be like this conclave meeting, like what's up with that? And he's like, oh yeah, it's going to be happening in three days. Um, it's going to be happening whether you're there or not. And basically says like it's at the North Pole um, and essentially is like the domain of the witch, I think of wind and sky, I think is what it was. Um, but basically says that, hey, if you go to that meeting, you need to know they're going to try to destroy you. Not only are they going to try to destroy you, they're going to try to destroy your position, uh, the witch of the world heart. And the only way you can avoid it is by convincing them that another station must also be defeated or excuse me, destroyed, uh, to which they're going to realize they can't give up another station. Um, also mentions this key detail that if in every version you go to this meeting, if Suvi's not with you, you will die. <laughs> Um, to which she's like, Hey, Suvi, you want to come with me? And Suvi's like, yeah, I guess I, I should. Guess, yeah. Um, there's a couple other cool things. Um, uh, he gives Suvi like a bag of rubies and it's kind of like, you know, you'll know what to do with these like when it gets to that point. And then also I think gives in order to get to this meeting gives like a, an item out of a crate that he describes, like looks like a dinner plate yeah. and is like, basically like, Hey, if you use this at like the divination sands, it'll get you where you need to go though. It won't get you back. Um, and then one last detail, uh, he tells Suvi that for Kieran's going to be back under the empire's control within the next 24 hours. And that steel will be arriving back shortly. Um, that's pretty much, all the big notes from that conversation. Uh, and then as it's ending, uh, the wizard sly kind of poofs and teleports away and is like, good luck guys. Don't die. Um, <laughs> all that to say, they still have another meeting to have in this long day. And they decide to go over to Haverford to see, uh, Suvi's old friend, Hana and her father, the artificer Galt. Um, do you want to take it from there? Yes, sir. Um, is it Haverford or Haverwert? don't know now okay. that you say it because i wrote down wert but you said ford and i was like oh wait, i don't know which one it is I um, have referred okay but now i don't know have her worked have her worked <laughs> they both sound like they're right yeah so y'all y'all forgive will, us if we're i will point out i guess it was last episode we didn't talk about but brennan joked about how there's like 50 million names now yeah. and like so much lore and he's like you didn't even realize what we're getting into <laughs> so who knows which one it is <laughs> yeah y'all let us know in the comments um so the crew, I'm just going to say word for now, because that's what I have written down. The yeah. crew travels to have a word to go see Galt. Um, they enter a shop <clears throat> that says Tullover on it, and it's like this industrial factory, but yeah, it's not that big. It says there's only like 20 to 30 workers inside of it. Um, and inside, uh, Hana is working at one of the desks, and Brenna describes her as this like bone white hair, but like part of her face and neck are like deteriorated. 
um, <clears throat> presumably from the accident that we learned about a couple episodes ago. Um, but anyway, as the crew enters, Galt recognizes Suvi and is like, oh, hello. <clears throat> and as they're quickly like making introductions, there is this sudden influx of jewel hoppers, which are these like gym like crickets that um, yeah. enjoy eating like gemstones and precious metals. And in this industrial factory, that's like a feast for them. So they're quickly like, oh, we got to handle this. <clears throat> um, so Galt and Suvi both start trying to take these things out and Ame managed to, to catch one to keep for herself. Um, so <clears throat> after that kind of settled down, settles down a little bit, um, Ame and Galt kind of excuse themselves to go talk privately. And um, Galt says that uh, Rin or Ame says that Rin referred to you as a true friend. And uh, Ame actually tells him of her passing because he had not heard. <clears throat> and while they're having their conversation, Suvi goes and sneaks up on Hana and kind of surprises her and hugs her and, you know, catches up with her really quick. And she reveals that they're working on creating um, staff caps, but also shields here. And Suvi's like, perfect. Uh, we're trying to get a shield for uh, my friend here, uh, Bear, which is Ursulan, obviously. Mm -hmm. And they're like, could we maybe get one of these shields that you're making? <clears throat> and Hana's like, well... We aren't making these to like sell them. This is this has been commissioned by the Citadel. And we later find out that these are being turned into those sentient um, soldiers that we saw in a couple episodes yeah, previous. Well. Yeah, thank you, Tamori. <clears throat> um, but she's like, uh, but let me go ask my dad. Like maybe maybe we've got an extra one to spare. Um, so we cut back to Ame and Golt now. And uh, Ame is like, <clears throat> apologies, you know, I don't have too much time to catch up with you and learn about your history with my or with grandmother Rin, but I would love to. Um, but I'm in a position where I'm short on time and I just, you know, I need help. Um, and so Goat reveals that uh, a little bit of his history with Rin, saying that he first met her back when he was traveling to build the traveling door to Silbury. Um, and this would have been about 25 years ago. And that's when he met Rin because some of the things in building that door were going awry. <clears throat> they had a lot of issues and Rin was actually the one to help them solve these issues. And this is the same time um, that Galt uh, met Stone, Suvi's mother, and presumably the same time that Stone met Rin as well <clears throat> because she was an abjurer at the time and she was there to help with this door uh, as well. And he says that Rin back then talked a lot about the taboo of passage, saying that it has to do with the magical definition of roads and what roads were. And that's why this like door was having issues. Um, <clears throat> and it's at this point that uh, Hana walks into the room and asks about the shield for Ursulan, and they start talking in another language, their native language, presumably, um, Tuscavi, which is a vassal state of the empire, we find out. And there's like a quick exchange, and Hana is described as like looking bleak and kind of like not happy during this conversation. And Golt eventually says, just, just get the shield, Hana. Um, so then she leaves <clears throat> and uh, Golt continues saying that, you know, Rin was very kind to him. Um, artificers don't make the most money. And a lot of the times they have to find ways to provide for themselves to help make ends meet. And Rin helped him a lot with that. And he mentioned specifically that at one point, Rin had asked him for, I believe, a flawless sapphire. Um, and Ame can't remember ever seeing this or knows what he's talking about. Um, but at the end, he's basically like, yeah, like that's like the main information. Like, I'm apologies. I couldn't be of more help. Um, so then we cut back to Suvi, Ursulan, and Hana. <clears throat> and she's like, hey, we don't really have any spare shields, but what we do have are some prototypes. So you're welcome to take a look at those. Um, and so what Brennan does for this is pretty cool. He has each of the players roll an investigation check to look for these prototype shields. And then he tells them to describe to him what they found based on their roles. <clears throat> so in order of worst role to best role, uh, we first have Suvi who just describes like this small buckler that she found that like doesn't have an enchantment, but is ready to get one. Um, Ursula describes finding a massive tower shield, like way bigger than a normal human could carry, but you know, perfect for somebody like him. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, Ame with the highest role, uh, says she finds a shield like tucked away in the corner behind all the other ones with like this gold sheen to it. And then it like feels lighter than it looks. Um, and all three of these, by the way, can, can hold an enchantment. <clears throat> um, 
So they, they grab those three and they, you know, ask Hannah about it. And they're like, how much do we owe you? And she's like, no, my father would be honored to, to give you one. And um, Ame does an insight check on this moment <clears throat> and realizes that there's like this weird dynamic between Suvi and Hana because of their past and stuff. And that uh, what Abria reveals about Suvi is that like she's kind of unintentionally and is completely unaware of the fact of the new shift in their dynamic with Suvi being in such a high station in life and Hana not that it's kind of coming off as like she's speaking down to her. Um mm-hmm. <clears throat> So Ame picks up on that awkwardness and is in like a trying to be kind says like, oh, no, we can't accept this for free. Like in return, you will have a boon, a favor from the witch Mm -hmm. of the world's heart. And she gets like really excited about that and goes and tells her father. And Galt is like, whoa, a shield for a boon. Sure. Like take all three (laughs) of them if you want. Um, But they only actually take two. Uh, Ursulan chooses the one he described and the one Ame described. Um, So as the party take their leave, they do invite Hana to come join them for dinner at Chura's Chowder. Um, and she says she's busy, but, you know, if she gets off work in time, she'll join them. Um, <clears throat> so they leave and there's this kind of powerful moment as they leave where Suvi makes an insight check and kind of has that realization of the dynamic and kind of just the privilege she's had in her life for being such a status individual um, compared to somebody like Hana, who's going to spend the rest of her life in that steamy factory, you know, um, she doesn't, Suvi doesn't let anyone else know that she kind of is having this realization, but she has it. Um, so they go to the chowder shop. Um, Hana does not show up. Um, they eat and then they head on the platforms out of have a work to go back home. Um, but as they're riding it up, they do see out in the desert, <clears throat> all of these lights start popping up. And um, it's skyships um, up to, I think, four dozen Brennan mentions. Um, and he says, you've never seen this amount of military presence in your life before. And leading them all is Steel's flagship. And that's where the episode <laughs> ends. Um, again, that is episode 20 of Worlds Beyond Number. And if you are just catching the recap, you can check the description for our full discussion. Um, hope to see you there. <laughs>